thanks for being here. This is fantastic. Uh, really appreciate the turnout. As you can tell, this is going to be a Q&A, and it will be a Q&A with me at the beginning, but you later on. And uh, Emily has a signed copy of her book for the first good question, so be thinking of the those. The first things. good one, not right. the first question. I get to decide what's good. Um, <laughs> so, so Emily Chang is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the everything of Bloomberg Tech, which is a daily <laughs> tech TV show. I first met her face to face, although I watched the show a lot when I did some interviews in connection with, I guess, was it the GeekWire yeah. event in the fall? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, pretty interesting. Anyway, Emily, su subsequent to that time, uh, wrote this book, Brotopia. I suspect many of you have not read it. How many people have actually read the book? Oh, fantastic. Good. All right. Yay, thank Great. you. OK, so um, that's the subject of today's <clears throat> conversation. And l l let me say that you know I have a slide in a talk I sometimes give where I'm talking about increasing enrollments in computer science. And uh, part of what I say is that the, uh, the, the field is improving on its dismal reputation for how it treats women and minorities. And I think what this book reveals is that uh, either uh, I visit a very select group of companies or I am completely uh, sort of uh, inoculated against perceiving the things that go on, right? So um, I think one of the great things about the book is it not only talks about uh, what the problems are with really uh, examples that uh, stunned me, I have to say, uh, but it uh, presents some positive examples and it presents some potential solutions, okay? So it's not all bad news. It uh, talks to us about what we can do. And by the way, my benchmark for success was Ed being surprised and having learned something because right. you have one of the best computer science professors in the country. And so anyway, it was. if he thinks it's important, it's important and it it's scary. So, so <laughs> why don't we start there, which is what uh, persuaded you to write the book? What got yeah. you going in the first place? And obviously, you uh, spend your life with tech mm -hmm. people. So yeah, I guess you heard these stories. But why don't you tell us where this came from? Yeah, so I've been anchoring Bloomberg Tech, our show on Bloomberg Television, for eight years. And I've always you know, been concerned about the representation of women in business and in tech specifically. I mean, the numbers are just so bad. and. They are worth repeating. You know, women have 25% of jobs in this industry. They account for about 7% of venture capital investors. And women-led companies get just 2% of funding. Hardly believe that that is because women have just 2% of good ideas. Um, so, you know, that was always in the background. But my first order of business was trying to build the show and convince important people to come on the show. And so it was kind of politically incorrect to start asking these questions like, well, but what are you doing about hiring women? What are you doing about promoting women? What are you doing about funding women? But as the show grew, I became more courageous about you know, putting people on the spot. And people would kind of squirm. And you know, they would give the politically correct answer. And then they would get off the set, and they'd be like, oh. And they'd tell you what they really thought. And so I knew that there was so much more there. And then at the end of 2015, I was interviewing one particularly very prominent investor who, you know, they had no women in their firm at the time. And I said, you know, what do you think your responsibility is to hire women? And he said, well, we're looking very hard, but, you know, not enough women are studying STEM. And by the way, we're not prepared to lower our standards. This was on television. <laughs> um, and so that was really the spark that lit the fire. You know, I knew it was almost as if for a moment someone had actually told me the truth. And that there was, you know, part of the problem is people believe that they have to lower their standards in order to find talented women. And there was this amazing headline in Vanity Fair the next day that said, here's news to all you smart, talented women who want to work in technology. Apparently, you don't exist. And, you know, Clearly, the tech industry and these companies haven't been looking hard enough. You know, more women are graduating from college today. Women own 40% of businesses. This isn't just the right thing to do. This isn't just the fair thing to do. This is the smart thing to do to build better businesses and not have blind spots in your organization. Um, and this is an industry that is building the future, so it should represent um, the world's population. Focusing on VC for another minute here, there was an really interesting article by Claire Kane Miller in the New York Times maybe two years ago. And it reported on some work by a couple faculty members at uh, Berkeley's business school, at Haas School of Business. 
And what they had done was look at all the successful startups in, I'll get the statistics slightly wrong, a six year period in the Bay Area in New York and do a regression analysis on the attributes of the founders of these startups. Mm -hmm. okay? And uh, rather than a college dropout in a hoodie, the typical fo startup founder had a master's degree and was 35 years <laughs> old, about half in business and half in computer science. The interesting thing was when they looked at the data, they predicted that 20% of founders of successful startups should have been women. And the number was small single digit percent. So what's happening is VCs are looking for their a stereotypical founder, which probably is their view of themselves or something like that. Totally. And qualities that are seen as positive in men are seen as negative in women. So if you have an investor in, in, in evaluating a male and a female entrepreneur, you know, for men, if they're young, that's considered, you know, they have high potential. For women, if you're, they're young, oh, they're inexperienced. If a man is cautious, oh, that's kind of a good thing. If a woman is cautious, that's a red flag. And so, you know, we just don't think, we don't use words vi like visionary and genius to describe women. But we use those words to describe dozens and dozens of men. And so if you're looking at a male entrepreneur and considering funding them, there's this sort of simple risk benefit calculation you're doing in your head. Do we like this person? Can they execute? Do we like the idea? Whereas if it's a woman, it's a much bigger sort of, but does she have what it takes? Um, and I, you know, it makes me sad to think about, but I do think about all of the women who never got a chance to fund the next face, I mean, to start the next Facebook or Google or Apple simply because they didn't look the part. I'm, I'm laughing because back in October, you provoked me to rant about Facebook. I, that turned out to have been prescient, but it was kind <laughs> of out there at the time. Um, all right, so um, you know, you have uh, some hypotheses in your book about how we got to be this mm -hmm. way. What, what's, uh, what's the So story? this to me, the history of was really the smoking gun. Um, and I, I'll never forget when, um, you know, my researcher sent me, you know, a bunch of stuff that she'd been working on, and we were both like, oh my goodness, this is it. This is what we've been looking for the whole time. Um, in the 1940s and 1950s, women actually, play, I'm sure some of you in this room know this, women actually played a huge role in the computing industry. Men were very well represented and primarily represented among hardware makers, but women were very well represented among software programmers. And so they were programming computers for the military and programming computers for NASA. And it literally was like hidden figures, but industry-wide. And then in the 60s and 70s, the tech industry was exploding in size and was desperate for new talent. And so they started doing these personality tests and these aptitude tests to identify people who they thought would make good programmers. And um, one software company in particular hired these two psychologists who decided that good programmers, quote, don't like people. Well, if you look for people who don't like people, the research tells us you'll hire far more men than women. Um, glad you're laughing a little bit there. Um, there's also no research to support this idea that people who don't like people are better at this job than people who do, or that men are better at this job than women. In fact, there's a plethora of, of evidence to support the idea that we need people who like people and care about people or empathetic to the, the problems of the users that they're trying to solve to be building these products and services for the world. Because as I said, billions and billions of people are using them. But these tests were widely influential. They were used for decades by companies as big as IBM, and they shut out more than half the population. And so the tech industry, in my view, created the pipeline problem by having such a narrow idea of who could do this job. I'm not saying there isn't a pipeline problem. There is. But in 1984, women hit the high point earning computer science degrees. They were earning 37% of degrees. That has since plummeted to 18% where it's been flat for the last decade. And you see about the same trend in jobs, the percentage of jobs held by women in this industry. And so even though the industry was exploding in size, the percentage of women in, the, in your seats was getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And now we're here today and you have the tech industry, industry saying, well, it's a pipeline problem. We can't do anything about that. Um, when in fact, you can't be what you can't see. And so um, at the end of the book, I interviewed these uh, seven young girls who've all learned how to code. Um, they're so excited about doing their part to change the world. But they read the news, and they know that you know, Sheryl Sandberg and Ginny Rometty are you know, very, you know, two of very few women who have cracked the silicon ceiling. And they, they also know, you know, one of them said to me, 
well, I was reading about Uber and I heard that Travis was like meditating in the lactation room. What's that about? <laughs> and so like they know, they know what's going on, you know? Um, and it is just another example that you can't be what you can't see. And the tech industry has so much to do to just create a better, as you said, a better working environment. Yeah, we were talking before we came down here, and something I was telling tech companies 20 years ago was instead of giving us money to have programs to address uh, gender diversity, they should clean up their employment act. They're, in some sense, create a supportive environment because word was getting out. In some sense, you know, my, my view, optimistic view, had been this was happening, but uh, it's obviously uh, spotty at best. Right, and all of these companies will point to the money that they're giving to programs, right. pipeline programs. But Google, for example, spends you know tens of millions of dollars on on pipeline issues, but they invested thirty billion dollars in their cloud business. Huge difference in right. priorities there. There is a pipeline problem, but to say it's a pipeline problem is to, uh, in some sense. Uh, finesse what you yourself can be doing about it. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so what, what in your view is the worst example in your book of something that goes on? <laughs> well, there are plenty, and also there are bright spots. Okay, you can have two. <laughs> um, look, I do think there are some egregious examples in the book, and some of you may have heard about those. Uh, you know, Uber was one of the biggest offenders where, you know, some of you may have heard of Susan Fowler, who is the woman engineer who worked at Uber, and she uh, wrote this viral memo about her experience being sexually harassed on the job. On her first day on the job, her manager propositions her for sex over the company chat system. So she takes screenshots of it, brings it to HR, and says, look what this guy said to me. And HR says, well, we're going to let that slide because he's a high performer. And you know, this was not necessarily an isolated case. This is a company where, so three weeks after she posted this, I had 12 women engineers over at my home for dinner, some of them who worked at Uber. And they were like, we get invited to strip clubs and bondage clubs like in the middle of the day. Is that unusual? <laughs> um, and so, you know, for them- hey, at least they're included. They, they could go out drinking <laughs> in the middle of the day. And if they came back at 3 a.m., it didn't matter as long as they got their work done. And so, some of these things are just so obviously crossing a line, but in general, what these women told me is that, you know, they're often the only woman in the room over and over and over again. And so that's isolating, that can be exhausting, and it can be very frustrating because they're often put in this position of having to prove themselves over and over again. And it's kind of this emotional labor, this entire second job that doesn't count for anything. Um, and so, it's not these sort of more isolated, egregious examples that are the biggest problem. It's the systemic discrimination that works against everyone. And it means that people can't reach their full potential. Women can't reach their full potential. Men don't have, the, we, we all don't have the benefit of, of, of right. their potential contributions. So you talked about these uh, sort of screening tests for employment that go back mm -hmm. a long way and are tilted. You, you've got some comments about meritocracy in mm -hmm. your Book. I, I have to say that to me, something that's concerned me a lot is the uh, now in vogue quantitative assessments, mm -hmm. okay? And, and what worries me is that previously, if you got a bad review, you could at least uh, have some self-esteem by saying, well, that guy is just biased, okay? I'm actually doing fine. <laughs> now what happens is you get this quantitative assessment that gives you a score at the end, and it's based on a set of criteria and a set of weighting factors. And the people yeah. who chose the criteria and the weighting factors are people who succeeded under the existing system. Mm -hmm. So you're getting this unbiased quantitative assessment that says you fall short. And it's very hard to refute that, even though it has the same sorts of biases built in. Anyway, tell us about meritocracies. Well, so the argument about meritocracy is, first of all, in my view, a true meritocracy is impossible to achieve because we all come to the plate with different privileges and different levels of access and the escalator of life is moving faster for some of us than it is for others. And fascinating little tidbit about just the word meritocracy, it was coined actually in the 1950s by a British sociologist who was using it to warn about the future of this dystopian world where everyone just, you know, 
use their education <laughs> and that. success to justify their success, <laughs> basically. So, you know, it was, a, you know, where it would become a tool to sort of justify the success of the winners and the lack thereof of the, of the losers and say, well, everyone's in their right place because we're in a meritocratic system. Um, and it's funny, actually, 50 years later, right before he died, he wrote an op-ed saying, I'm so disturbed by the fact that my term, which I threw out there as a warning, has now become you know, used by prime ministers and presidents to talk about how wonderful their, their societies are working. Um, and when you believe you are operating in a meritocracy, you can actually be more anti-meritocratic. And sorry, this sounds a little jargony, but um, if you think that everyone in, is in their right place, you don't question. You're blind to the, the discrimination and systemic factors that are working against the people that, who are not succeeding. Mm -hmm. um, and so Silicon Valley has always styled itself as a meritocracy. Anyone here can succeed. And you know, the book is called Protopia, which I know makes a strong statement. Um, and in my view, epitomizes this idea of Silicon Valley as a modern utopia where anyone can change the world, anyone can make their own rules if they're a man. But if you're a woman, it is incomparably harder. And there are, you know, I use the PayPal mafia, the, the founders and, and early employees at PayPal, who had this huge, huge exit and then went on to found, found companies, join each other's companies, fund each other's companies. You know, it became this super influential network that just so happened to be all men. Um, and they called it a meritocracy. And there were no women involved. <laughs> and you can't tell me that's because only men have good ideas. And Peter Thiel was just better than all the women. <laughs> um, so that's how, I, that's how I take down meritocracy in my book. So you've <laughs> got this uh, new uh, article you wrote suggesting that uh, Amazon strive for 50-50 in HQ2 wherever it will wind up. Tell us how that's going down. Yeah, so you know, companies always say it's a pipeline problem. And they say they're working on it, but it's going to take years because they're so undiverse already. Um, well, Amazon has this opportunity to start from scratch with HQ2. They're going to be creating 50,000 new jobs. And in my view, there's no reason that Amazon can't build a 50-50 balanced workforce from the beginning, if they are thinking about this, if they care about this, and represent people of color in line with the local population. And so what we did is we picked the, they have 20 cities that are on the short list. We picked the top three that um, you know, map the best for uh, women in STEM and women in the workforce in general. Um, and it's been, <laughs> the, the reaction has been very interesting because you know, this is a company that you know, historically, it's been very secretive. Um, you know, they do have some programs, and they have a page about diversity. But you know, I, you know, to add, you know, had sources inside Amazon Web Services meeting where, you know, there, how many people are in this room? What would you say, like two hundred? Like okay, so they have meetings of two hundred people, and five people in the room are women. That's a typical day. That's just a day in the life of an Amazon Web Services employee. Um, and you know, this is a company that is building the future. We can't have the vast majority of people in this industry, the people who are making decisions, being almost entirely men. Um, you know, I interviewed Ev Williams, who's the co-founder of Twitter, towards the end of the book. And I asked him, if you had had women on the early Twitter team, do you think online harassment and trolling would be such a problem? And he was like, hmm. No, actually, I don't think so. Like, actually, we weren't thinking about these things when we were building Twitter. We were thinking about wonderful and amazing things that could be done with it, not how it could be used to send death threats or rape threats. And yeah, actually, maybe the internet would be a friendlier and less hostile place if we had done so. And so, you know, what if women had had a seat at the table 30 years ago? Would uh, online harassment and trolling be such a problem? Would porn be so ubiquitous? Would video games be so violent? Would there be better parental controls on things like YouTube? Facial recognition technology is already a little bit sexist and a little bit racist and doesn't recognize women and people of color as easily as it does white right. men. And so in my view, you know, so we've never shied away from hard problems, right? That's what the tech industry does. They tackle hard problems. So. If you can get us to Mars and you can build self-driving cars, 
you can hire more women and pay them fairly and fund their ideas. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so give us some good examples. Give us some hope. Give us some hope. Um, <laughs> So I, you know, when you were talking about the the technical screening, I, I, the the last chapter of the book is really focused on solutions, um, and you know I do think that change needs to come from the top, and we need CEOs and top investors to make this a number one priority. There's a whole chapter on Google about how Google's founders made this priority in the early days. They hired these incredible women, they built this incredible business, and then they lost focus and they lost sight of it, and now you know their numbers are average, just like everyone else's. Um, when you look at Slack, which is, you know, obviously a much younger company. Can I make company. a comment there? Yeah. Google also had some highly placed women who succeeded by acting like men. Okay? And that's so, a problem. Well, okay. And that's another conversation. I can't tell you how many times people said to me as I was writing the book, well, you're going to write about mean girls, right? And mean, mean women bosses. And you know what? <laughs> I, Sheryl Sandberg did this amazing article in the New York Times about how Women, when they think there's only room for one, are more competitive with each other. So if there's only one room, woman on the board, they're less likely to help other women. If there's only one woman on the executive team, they're, they're less likely to help other women. But if there's three, they're like, oh, actually, it's not this dog-eat-dog -dog world. I, you know, maybe I, I should be helping my, my comrades. Um, and unfortunately, we just don't have enough examples of women in leadership in general. And so I, 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 I know you're talking about, um, I'm sure you're talking about Marissa Meyer in particular. Um, <laughs> but what the problem is, we don't have enough examples of Marissa Meyers. You know, like we don't, there are so many different styles of leadership, and we see that in so many different kinds of men. But we don't see that in women. Okay. And so we, we look at the one way she succeeded and think, oh, that must be the way to succeed for a woman is to act like a man. But that's just only one small example. And if we had more women in leadership roles, we would see so many different ways to lead. And so, you know, I decided that I didn't want to be, you know, I don't want to be guilty of stereotyping even further. There's amazing research that, that shows that women and men are far more similar than they are different. And any, you know, just as ambitious, just as willing to take risks. And the differences that you see are a result of socialization. And so, you know, we, we've heard the examples of, you know, in a meeting. So, for example, a lot of these tech companies are really aggressive, super confrontational. It's like this debate culture, and you know, all of the good ideas are supposed to rise to the top. Well, actually, women, when they act like that, are unlikable <laughs> for cultural reasons. Um, and so they find that if they act that way, it doesn't necessarily work in their favor. And so there are all of these social and cultural forces that are working against women that, in my view, would be soft if we just had more women at the table. Like, if you have a dinner table and you have 10 men around it, you swap out one man for a woman, the conversation will change, like, a little bit. But if it's half and half, it's a completely different conversation. And that's what needs to happen to have a real culture change. And then maybe we'd, we'd be able to see, well, OK, is that really the only way to succeed if you're a woman? Are all of the women CEOs succeeding because they're acting like men or not? Oh, we, we were on a positive thread. Yeah. Oh, yes. I, I, <laughs> I torpedoed it. So let's get to, back to that. So, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> look, there are, are some many good examples. And actually, I should mention that some of the best examples are companies that are run by women. And so if you look at uh, Rent the Runway or Stitch Fix or Eventbrite, you've got women CEOs and you've got a gender balanced workforce. So just having a diverse group of people at the top of an organization, they attract other people who are also diverse and who care about these things. Um, at Slack, Stuart Butterfield, the CEO, has made this like his mission. And he tweets about it. He talks to everyone in the organization about it. They know. And if your boss wants you to do something, like generally, you do it. Um, and so some of the things that they've done, they've diversified their recruiting teams. They've got recruiters of every size, slice, color. They are sourcing from underrepresented schools, HBCUs, different geographical regions, schools in the South, sourcing across a range of ages. I mean, the tech industry also has an ageism problem. Um, and I think it's underreported. Um, you know, but Slack very much, you know, they don't have ping pong tables. They're not like trying to be a college dorm fantasy land. Um, they, their motto is work hard and go home. <laughs> and so, you know, 
it's it's about sustaining people over the course of their lives some of the most surprising research that i found is that you know hiring is one thing but it's retention and progression right. that is equally if if not more important and so women are twice as likely to quit tech as men and they're not going home to take care of their families they're taking jobs in other fields they're 800% more likely to leave jobs in tech than they are to leave jobs in other fields and you know they cite all the same reasons like hostile environment work life balance and these are things that men want too you know the things that are good for women are also good for men they're good for people and so that's something that i think if companies sort of realize well hey this is good for everyone that maybe it would be it would be more to, mo more motivation and slack has actually proven that they can beat not only the industry average they can beat the pipeline problem just by being a good place to work so they have uh 44% women across the company women are 48% of managers and i believe women in technical roles is something like 35% which is you know still not where it needs to be but it's a lot better than the rest questions from you folks i've got more but let's hear from you <laughs> larry do you have thoughts about other industries, biotech, engineering, et cetera, same or different? Similar. Um, you know, computer science in particular has the worst, I believe, dearth of, of, of women. And actually, engineering and biotech index even better than computer science. But other STEM fields definitely have similar problems. But it is computer science that has the worst of it. And you probably know far better than I do what's happening in the education system and, and why that is. But um, I wonder, for example, there are a set of work environment issues in the computing industry, right, that are not yet solved. And I wonder if those exist in other industries. Sexism and sexual harassment exist everywhere. So this is not a problem that's unique to Silicon Valley. But I can't tell you how many times people said to me, oh, Silicon Valley can't possibly be worse than Wall Street. Well, in fact, it is. So Wall Street is actually, if you look at the top banks, it's 50-50. They have a lot of work to do when it comes to women in leadership positions. Um, what I think makes, and I, by the way, I started writing this book before Trump was elected, before Me Too, I was ask before about that. all of this. And, you know, what I think makes Silicon Valley different is this belief that we're changing the world and that we're kind of better than everybody else. And in a way, that's been like an impediment to admitting that Silicon Valley is also part of the problem. And so much wealth and so much power has been accrued in such a short span of time. And we're talking about more money, more power, more responsibility than Wall Street, than you know Hollywood. Um, and that's led to a sense of arrogance and entitlement that I think is part of the problem. And, 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 and a sense of moral exceptionalism that divorces you from Reality. I just spent uh, 18 months on a National Academy study committee of sexual harassment in academia. And I'm not allowed to talk about the report until it <laughs> oh, appears in June. But um, yeah, it's through review now. But I, I have to say it is just staggering. Things are no better in academia than anywhere else. And um, you know, the data on underreporting, for example, is stunning. You know, when you ask someone if they've experienced harassment, they say no. And when you say, well, have you experienced any of the following specific things, all of which satisfy the legal definition of harassment, they say yes, 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 yes. <laughs> OK, so uh, just through sort of bad survey methodology, uh, there's a tremendous under-reporting independent of the uh, reluctance to bring things up the HR hierarchy for fear of blowback. And look, you know, I do think the public pressure and the conversation we've been having has really made a difference. So Uber just today announced that they're ending forced arbitration, which means that employees and passengers who have a sexual harassment or assault complaint don't have to settle those claims in private. They can do so publicly. And that is, that is a huge step forward. Um, we'll see what happens, but it is, it definitely would not have happened if Susan Fowler didn't do what she did. So, so here's my pet theory, which you will immediately rebut, OK? <laughs> I, I believe that while Seattle, I'm based on almost no evidence, that while Seattle has a long distance to go, it's not as bad as Silicon Valley. And 
I base this on um, a set of companies around here and their leadership. I look at Microsoft with Brad Smith as president. I look at uh, Zillow and Redfin, which have really very principled leadership. I look at the fact that to muck out the stables at Uber, they brought Zara, Dara down from <laughs> Seattle, OK? So I, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's my um, sort of regional contentedness and self-promotion version I'm, of this, I'm, not to deny <laughs> Uh, the need to do much better here than we're doing. Um, it's nice that you feel that way, but I'm happy, <laughs> happy to rebut, happy to rebut. So um, you're not the first person who's raised this with me. Um, my, my, this is my second time coming to Seattle since publishing the book, and I spoke at Microsoft and Amazon and Redfin. I'm speaking at Zillow. Um, and you know, I've been really encouraged by the fact that these companies are inviting me to come mm -hmm. in and talk about this, because they could easily say, Look, your book is called Brotopia. No, thank you very much. Do execs talk to you at those companies? They do. Yeah. They spend time with you. Yes. Okay. Um, and you know, employees are coming up to the microphone and they're fired up and they're asking questions. What can we do? Um, but if you look at the actual numbers, Seattle is no better than Silicon Valley. In fact, it's a little worse. And I said women-led companies get 2% of funding. Well, in Seattle, they get 1% of funding. So I'm sorry. There you go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to break that news to you. But look, you know, there is there All right, is we're good done. Momentum. Have a cookie on your <laughs> And you know, I don't know if any of you have been following, but Amazon just this week, they, they got a shareholder proposal to require Amazon's board to interview a diverse slate of candidates when they're looking for new directors. It's called the Rooney Rule. Some of you may have heard of it. And Amazon's board immediately rejected this proposal. And there was a revolt inside the company. And just yesterday, Amazon said, OK, well, we'll do it. And so you know, you know, these things matter. It's not going to happen overnight. But the conversation that we're having and the public pressure, it, it can really make a difference. More questions up here. Let's, let's take a woman's question. We'll, we'll get to, we'll alternate. What role uh, do you think legislation and nonprofits such as universities play, especially when we're talking about like pay equity? Uh, I, I have a strong suspicion that the people who have benefited from the current structures are not particularly willing to change unless there is a demand. <coughs> Uh, the demand you just mentioned is one, but um, you know, I, I personally don't see anyone clamoring to say that like 50% of the money that's spent on salaries at a tech company should be spent on female salaries, right? Like, I like that idea, though. I know, right? Can you imagine? Right, and 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 by the way, the pay gap in Silicon Valley is five times the national average. So, for an industry that loves data. Just look at your own data. And to me, this is like the easiest thing to solve, right? Well, you're very who, wealthy companies. Right, but who's measuring the promotion gap, which I think is the, the less told story, OK? Because women. Well, and but the pay can also lead to eat, like what, if you want to stay in the workforce at all, right? right. It's, a direct, you know, it's directly correlated to how valued you feel. Right, but you can imagine that women in particular roles, the easiest thing to do is to pay women in equivalent roles the same as men, which of course nobody does, OK, or few people do. But even if they do, you could imagine that women stay in those roles twice as long because they are slower to be promoted. Right, and certainly pay is not the only thing that matters, but it is one thing that matters that is easily, to your point, easily measured. You know, I, I get asked about quotas all the time. Um, I actually think quotas are a, a very interesting idea, especially from a university perspective, and I know that there are some legal issues but you know we have to understand that men and women are you know boys and girls are coming to the table with different levels of experience and facing all of these cultural issues that happen at sort of every stage of life that said i think you guys are doing amazing work just supporting women through the field and getting them to graduate with computer science degrees and i believe you guys are indexing far better than yeah. universities across the country and that's so important, but you have, you know, one of the most woke professors in the country <laughs> running your department. So, you know, Definitely I'm actually go, curious what you think about what you think about quotas and and and, and regulation of this, and I whether you are, think that could have an impact. It could. There are legal issues, and I think this uh, 
you, you know, back to the Amazon board, I think the, the, the data is pretty compelling that if uh, underrepresented groups are considered as part of the pool, they get selected in sort of uh, in, in proportion. Right. You know, again, I've seen this in the National Academies, for example, as, as when there was an incentive for nominating women, mm -hmm. women got elected, you know, because they are highly qualified. It's just guys don't think of them. Right. And I do think, you know, in any interview process, you should be, you shouldn't even start the process until you have qualified female candidates and qualified right. candidates right. of color. There was, um, there's a, a venture capital firm called Upfront Ventures that's doing something really interesting when they give an entrepreneur a term sheet. If they basically have tech's version of the inclusion rider that Frances McDormand talked about at the Oscars, where you're committing to building a diverse team, you're committing to interviewing a diverse slate of candidates for every single position. And one of these entrepreneurs came up to me and said, well, we're really small, we're only six people, but two of them are women and two of them are underrepresented minorities, so it's actually working. And so that's the power, <laughs> the power of rules. <laughs> Got it, who else? Yeah. Um, how much of this disparity do you think is attributed to lack of soft skills? And also for Ed, what do you think we could do in college level education to facilitate the development of these soft skills that can possibly help break down the barriers? So I do think that empathy in general is underrepresented. Um, and I'm sure some of you heard about James Damore, who at Google uh, wrote a viral memo in which he argued that men are biologically more suited to programming than women, which in fact is the same argument that was made by those psychologists 50 years ago, and it's a completely mistaken assumption, and he cited all of these researchers who disagree with how he used the data. Um, there is no evidence to support the idea that men are better at this job than women, but there's many, many arguments um, to be made in favor of having a diverse group of people who have all kinds of skills, soft and hard, whatever you want to call them, um, making these products that are being used by billions and billions of people. If you don't have a diverse group of people making these products, you will have blind spots. You will miss things. Your products won't be as good as they could be, period. So you've made a really important point, which is that we try to support women. We pay much less attention to bringing men along. Okay, and I think that's a really important point. Now, having a reasonable representation of women probably helps the community as a whole develop the sorts of skills you're talking about, but we could do better on that side for sure. Way in the back. Um, since you had your cameo on Silicon Valley, I was wondering about your impression on specifically that type of show kind of being broadcast to a lot of people who might be watching it and thinking this is what tech is like. So I know that Silicon Valley has been knocked for its portrayal or lack thereof of women. I think they are conscious of that and we've seen women better represented in successive seasons. That said, in my view, Silicon Valley is art imitating life. It is not you know, life imitating art. You know, this problem existed decades before Silicon Valley the show was made and I you know, think their responsibility is to entertain and get people to watch their show it's not to change the representation of gender in the tech industry. That's the tech industry's problem. Um, in your book, you question whether harassment uh, would be as present on platforms such as Twitter and Reddit if more women were involved. Um, you say that privacy concerns around companies like Facebook would be as bad if they, had, if they didn't have those blind spots by hiring more women or more empathetic people. So that's a really interesting question. So. Um, and that was one of the most, one of was just sort of an interesting nugget that I, I uncovered. When, so Sheryl Sandberg joined Facebook in 2008. And at the time, Mark Zuckerberg, in those early years, was really obsessed with openness and Twitter. Twitter was taking off, owning real time news, owning international. And he was like, you know, what's happening? Maybe people want to share more than we thought they, they would. And he was really focused on pushing people to share more. And they had this feature. Um, location tagging where you could tag someone in a location but you couldn't untag yourself. So like I could say, hey, I'm hanging out with Mark Zuckerberg in Las Vegas. And he couldn't say, um, no, I'm in Palo Alto. <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, which is a perfect use case. Like, well, you, people should have the freedom to untag themselves if they don't want to be tagged. And this issue became like a knockdown, drag out situation within Facebook and you had people 
like Zuckerberg on one side and people like Sheryl Sandberg on the other side saying like, look, well, let's think about a woman who is tagged in a situation, a compromising situation or a compromising photo that she wouldn't want to be in. This just doesn't make sense. And so um, ultimately it did not come to, to be, but it is a perfect example of how having a diversity of people at the table, they had different opinions, you know, and they came to a decision that in my view is better for all users. Um, and what's interesting about Zuck and Cheryl is that he made as much space for her in their partnership as she did for him. Clearly, it's not perfect. Um, but I, I, I do think that her leadership has been really, really important, not just because she's a woman, but because she has a different perspective. She's, she's older, she's had different experiences, and so you know, it's not only our gender that makes us different. Um, but we all have, you know, and, and I talk a little bit about race in the book, and we talk about age, and we talk about, you know, maybe you didn't graduate from college. We all have different parts of our identity that in a way are like a, a ball and chain. There's something that we can't escape from. And so being a woman is one thing. Being a woman of color is another thing. Being a woman of color who's gay is another thing. And so you can double, or if you talking about double and triple minorities, you can sort of double and triple just sort of how hard it is to be in this industry if you have you know, more of these you know, parts of your identities that can make things more complicated in an industry where most people are male and white. Um, and so you know, my, my Facebook example is not to say that Facebook is perfect, but here's an example of how having a diversity of, of, of genders, in this case, led to an outcome that I believe was better for users in the long run. By the way, harassment is very much dependent on uh, race and a set of other factors, OK? So looking at harassment through the lens of women is too coarse a grain to understand the phenomenon. Well, Pretty and you know, men experience online harassment too, but women actually experience the most extreme forms of it. And they're more likely to be harassed simply because they are right. women. So simply because of their Yeah, gender. what I was saying was in the workplace, African-American women, for example, experience different forms and, in fact, greater forms of harassment mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. Caucasian women. And, and Ellen Powell actually makes the argument that it's not having just women at the top of these companies, but women of color right. that will right, right. make an even bigger mm -hmm. difference. Linda, you had a question. Yeah, I've been appointed to a sexual harassment complaint committee for the upcoming national conference in my field. Mm. And there's been a document about what harassment consists of to put forth to the members. And a member of the executive committee has asked, what, what exactly are we going to do if there's a complaint? And I'm wondering, what do companies do, if anything? And what do conference committees do if there's a complaint about sexual harassment? Well, first of all, there needs to be a process. Um, and these, these processes need to be decided and written down so that when there is a complaint, you're not sort of reacting to just the complaint. You're following the process that's been put in place. And part of the problem is so many of these companies, A, they're too young. They haven't thought about these things. And venture capital firms, they're too small. They, they also haven't thought about these things. They just didn't have policies. Um, and so one of the most one of one of the recent sort of campaigns in VC has been called hashtag moving forward, which is just pushing venture capital firms and startups to make their harassment and discrimination policies public, which sounds pretty straightforward, but actually they don't have them in the first place. So they've been forced to actually write them down <laughs> and then publicize them, which is a really good exercise. I mean, I just think we can't, we have to deal with these things before they happen. Um, Otherwise, you have, an, you have an emotional reaction, which won't necessarily be the right reaction or the reaction that you would have if you, you know, followed a sort of standard procedure. There are fields that are ahead of yours in that they've been doing this for several years. And you could probably find processes on the web that you could scoop up. Way in the back, somewhere over here. Close enough. I uh, just wanted to ask about your perspective on uh, tokenization and, uh, and un, you know, unrecognized emotion of labor. This, this is in academia as well, of course, um, in, the, in the sense that, you know, my colleagues who are um, uh, women or people of color are asked to serve on committees, uh, uh, be, be the face of representation of diversity, um, uh, women who mentor other women um, on, their, on their path of success. And after they've done all this labor, 
they look around and all the men have been writing grants and starting uh, their businesses and so on and, and haven't had time, needed time to do all these things. Yeah. What do you think about this? The same thing has happened at Google, where you know women were supposed. To, part of one of the solutions was to get women in every single interview process, and then they weren't doing the work. And then when it came time to promotion, they were like, they didn't have anything to show for it because they were always interviewing. Um, and so I definitely think that's a problem, and we need men to be part of these committees too, because as you said, like we need to we need to do this together. You know, this can't be a conversation that women and underrepresented minorities are having with themselves. Um, and speaking of tokenization, I think another problem is you'll often see, you know, you'll see some of these venture capital firms which have hired their first women in 40 years. And they're like, okay, we're done. <laughs> well, obviously one is not enough because we're talking about a real culture change that is necessary. That said, you know, I do think that it is incumbent on everyone to participate. And so I wouldn't be comfortable just saying, me as a woman saying, no, I'm not gonna help because I don't wanna be tokenized. Um, you know, there is this sort of balance that needs to be struck of playing the rules of the game and changing the rules of the game as we go. You can't just run in and say, I'm just going to do everything differently. That's not necessarily going to be well received. But you can play the game that's on the field and change the, change the rules of the game as you go so that the game and the playing field becomes more level. OK, we have time for one or two more questions. Emily needs to be out of the door at five to five, or she's going to miss her next appointment. Here, please. Yes, to what extent do you think you can have a change in Silicon Valley of this change of the rules of the game, as you said, of this impolite treatment of women and minorities until we have change in the leadership of our government that is also seems to have very much these same symptoms of impolite treatment of women and minorities? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as I said, this is a cultural issue, and it's certainly not limited to Silicon Valley. Um, you know, what I would say is that these companies have a choice. You know, all of these companies have a choice about how they run themselves. And you know, there was some there was some conflicting opinions about James Damore, who was ultimately fired at Google, um, and people, you know, were concerned that that was tromping on freedom of speech. But you. Free, speech is not free if other people are free, being silenced, right? Um, and so all of these organizations have a right to decide the rules and the cultures, the rules that they want to implement and the culture that they want to create, regardless of who is president um, and regardless of, uh, you know, unfortunately how some people in this country might treat women, which I think is, is, is tragic, um, but they have an opportunity to do something different. Um, and to lead on these issues. And so I think that the conversation that we're having is is, is incredibly important. Um, you know, I, for example, someone told me she gave her book, my book to her CEO, and he read it, and like within two weeks had scheduled a trip to visit 30 different cities, to visit, you know, their headquarters and to visit their offices in 30 different cities around the world and talk about this. And that she was getting more funding for, you know, girls in STEM, more funding for diversity initiatives at the company. And like those are things that I mean that means so much to me. Like, if that's just happening at one company, that's success. But really, success is going to be when we don't have to talk about this anymore. <laughs> when you know a woman engineer or a woman CEO is normal, and a woman directing Hollywood movies and running for president or being president is normal. And I hope that happens in my lifetime. <laughs> one more. Yeah, please. What's the best way to deal with tokenism? Uh, a few years ago when I applied for an internship, someone from that company, not the, like not on that team I was applying for, but someone from that same company had told me that I needed to put in my resume somewhere something that would indicate that I was black, otherwise I wasn't going to get the internship, which was not something I wanted to hear. Um, so what's like the best way to deal with tokenism? Because when I start interviewing, I realize I'm like, ooh, I am a token here. Mm -hmm. So look, in my view, I, so I, I, I had a similar experience in my first um, job after graduating from college. I got into this super amazing program for aspiring news producers and reporters. And I found out that it was a diversity program. And it was like a dagger to the, I, like, I was like, oh, that's why I'm here. Like, it was like a dagger to the heart. Um, 
That said, now looking back, A, I'm really glad I had that opportunity, and B, I would celebrate your uniqueness and, ex uniqueness and exploit it because you have so much to offer. Um, why not? Like, why not? Um, that, that said, you know, you can only do as, do as much as you feel comfortable. And I think we all should be choosing places to work and choosing environments to be in where we feel supported and we feel like we can learn and we feel like we can really be ourselves. Because you don't want to be anywhere where you can't be yourself. It's just not worth it. And there are so many companies out there that are desperate to find talented people who don't look like them where you can really make a difference. And maybe, maybe you don't, maybe you are more isolated in the, in the beginning, but you attract more people who look like you, and that makes a real culture change somewhere. Um, and you know, as I've said, you know, we have to do this together, and you know, I think we all need to listen to each other more, and we need to ask, how are you doing? Um, these are things that we just don't ask enough; we just do. Um, and so, you know, I'm excited to be able to start this conversation, and for you to continue this conversation when you leave this room. Um, and help us all get to, the, to a better place. Great way to wind up. Before we thank Emily, um, let's see. First of all, it's on Amazon. It's, <laughs> it's a, it is a really educational book. And it has its uplifting parts as well as its shocking parts. Um, did you here have a young woman in the glasses looking down? Do you have a copy of the book? Yes. OK. You do now. You asked the all, right. all the questions were good, but all right. uncollected. Two. I've and got, I've got one for both of you, you and you. Great. Right. Okay. Wait, and can you guys? I want to take a picture of you with Ed and tweet it. Can you guys okay. not move? A Wait, selfie. Here. Hang here, on a second. Get it. Here, all this is fine. I'll take it of you. Here, it's just a, Okay. Here, we'll do. We can do a selfie too. Yay! Wait, wave. Say hi. Oh my goodness, you guys are so cute. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Emily, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.